Always watch Jerusalem. That's the barometer. All end time prop- prophecy basically concerns Jerusalem. Don't ever let anyone pull you off course by looking way out here or out here. He's in the desert. He's out there because that, that won't work. Won't fly. Our subject this afternoon is the wrath of God. Let's get right into it. Open your Bibles to the great book of Revelation chapter 16. And we do ask a word of wisdom from our Father in Yeshua's name. Revelation chapter 16 pertains to the wrath of God. The wrath of God happens to be the, va- the vials. Verse chapter 16, verse 1, and it reads, And I heard a great voice out of the temple. Where was it from? The temple. Where's the temple? Jerusalem saying to the seven angels, go your ways, pour out your vials of the wrath of God upon the earth. Now, what you have to watch for here, when does, um, that's all right, we'll pick it up in a minute. (laughs) Don't know what that was. Somebody dropped their Timex, I think. (laughs) This is going to have a lot to do with time, so that's befitting. Um, when does God's wrath happen? The first trump, second trump, third time, trump? God's wrath doesn't come till right to the end. Many scholars have difficulty with this. Um, even my mentor basically thought it was the seventh trump. Now it starts in the sixth and immediately, you might say beginning just before the sixth trump, which is to say the appearance of the spurious messiah. So what we're dealing with is God's wrath when it's ready to be poured out. That's to say on those that follow the false Messiah that are misled and so forth. So let's fix the time a little better. Verse 2. And the first went and poured out his vial upon the earth and there fell a noisome and grievous sore or ulcer if you like upon the men which had the mark of the beast and upon them which worshiped his image. Now let's set our watches again here. If they're worshiping the image, what does that mean? The image is here. Okay. If they're worshiping the beast, if they've already got the mark, then he's here. So we just moved into the sixth trump right there. So you can just scratch off the veils to begin at the sixth trump and work through the seventh. So my point is this, check your time. Things begin to happen pretty fast with these. You know, it isn't all that long when they begin, all right, until the conclusion. Verse 3, and the second angel poured out his vial upon the sea and it became as the blood of a dead man and every living soul died in the sea. I have no doubt in my mind this is when God sends the strong delusion. His, that's part of his wrath. And his strong delusion as it is mentioned in Second Thessalonians chapter 2 when he said, Hey, if they want to be confused and believe any flyaway stuff which is not biblical, if they want to be deceived by the spurious Messiah, I'll help it out. I'll send them some strong delusion. That does create stomach problems, my friend, in a spiritual sense. When you get led down Primrose Lane and a person that is unlearned in the Word of God will have a very difficult time in that period because there will be supernatural entities on earth at that time as Michael, as it is written in Revelation 12, will kick the old boy himself out playing Jesus boy. And a lot of people are going to go bananas for him. <clears throat> They're going to think it is Christ. Because his main doctrine is, is I'm going to fly you away. He started it, he'll finish it. It's not biblical. All right? Let's continue on, verse 4. And the third angel poured out his vial upon the rivers and fountains of waters, and they became blood. And um, let's continue on to five. And I heard the angel of the waters say, Thou art righteous, O Lord, thou art and wast and shall be, because thou 
has judged us. In other words, they're getting what they deserve. That's what judgment is about. If you deserve reward, you're going to get reward. If you deserve correction, you're certainly going to get correction. Verse 6, for they have shed the blood of the saints and prophets, and thou hast given them blood to drink, for they are worthy. Now, who has shed the blood of prophets and saints? Jesus himself said, you're guilty of the blood from righteous Abel all the way down to Zacharias between the porch and the altar. Well, who slew Abel? We know, don't we? It was Cain. What is the Hebrew word kenite as it is used in God's word transliterated rather than translated? It means sons of, of Cain. They are the guilty ones. And this is where God says they're going to get theirs. All right? They're going to get theirs. Hey, I, that's great. That's judgment. That's fair. And that's the way it's going down. Verse 7. And I heard another out of the altar say, Even so, Lord God Almighty, true and righteous are thy judgments. You can count on that. Do, let me ask you something. You're not a person that wants anything but a fair shake, are you? Did you hear what I said? I said, you're not one of the people that would like something other than a fair shake. You know, that, that should please everyone. Because you get what you deserve. And that, you know, that's kind of life itself. That's the way life today is. Most people think they don't have a fair shake and they brought it on themselves. You can't mess up and be successful. It just doesn't work. That's just natural. Our Father is very fair. And you get what you deserve. Now, naturally, Satan's going to trip you up. But God has given you power as a can-do type person, that you can tell him where to go. And you know something? He's got to listen to you. When you do it in the name of Christ, you're in charge. So take charge. Take charge of your life. Don't mope, weep, and think you need a little extra edge. Do it. I mean, when you plow, plow deep. When it's too rough for everybody else, it's getting about right for us, all right? It's getting about right for you. That's the frame of mind you need to have when you got God behind you because it's a fact. That's a reality, not a wish, when you have that faith. Okay, so let's go with verse um, 7. Did I read that? And I heard another out of the altar say, Even so, Lord God Almighty, true and righteous are thy judgments. Eight. And the fourth angel poured out his vial upon the sun. Now, this is what I told you. I told you I was going to call on you on this. About the sun, all right? We covered it in the lecture before last. And power was given in him to scorch men with fire. Now, each of these plagues or wraths happened in Egypt. Nothing new about them except for this one. This one is different. This is new. This one did not happen in Egypt. The fourth vial stands totally out on its own. And It continues on its own. What does it accomplish? Verse 9. And men were scorched with great heat and blasphemed the name of God, which hath power over these plagues. And they repented not to give him glory. Do you know who it is that has that power of the sun? You know, we we did a little reading in chapter 11. Remember the other day? Let's go back there. Hold your place, though. We're coming back where we are to 16. Chapter 11 concerning those two candlesticks, the two churches, and concerning the two witnesses. Verse 4 of chapter 11 reads, These are the two olive trees and the two candlesticks standing before the God of the earth. Not heaven, earth. That means someone here, 
doing God's work. And if any man will hurt them, fire proceedeth out of their mouth and devoureth their enemies. And if any man will hurt them, he must in this manner be killed. These have power to shut heaven that it rain not in the days of their prophecy and have power over waters to turn them to blood, to smite the earth with all plagues as often as they will. So we see that the two candlesticks and the two witnesses are given or are utilized naturally with the two witnesses being that through which the Holy Spirit commands what does the Holy Spirit then do through the lampstand? Mark 13, they're delivered up before the evil one. Not to premeditate what they say beforehand, but what is given them at that hour, that time. You see, there's work to do ahead. It's fantastic. And we're moving into that. It's closing in. I'm not saying... It's going to happen tomorrow. I'm saying, but you need to be mentally and spiritually prepared for it today. Otherwise, what good are you? If you don't know what to expect or what God expects from you beforehand, do you think he can use you? As you've heard me use the analogy, if I've got two people to hire and I'm going to build me a brick outhouse, and I got a man here that's got 30 years experience with brick, and I got somebody that never laid one in his life, which am I going to use? Naturally, I'm going to use the experienced one. Or let's say you want a tooth extracted. Here I come along, I got a pair of pliers. <laughs> or you could go to the dentist. You know, I'll tell you, frankly, I've never had any experience pulling teeth, but I'll try, you know. I mean, naturally, you're going to take the one that is prepared and trained. So you must train yourself to be useful to God, and then the blessings flow. Because God knows you're serious-minded. He knows he can count on you. And therefore, in that preparation, well, you mean we're going to turn water? But no, it's deception. You're going to stop the deception. You're going to put it at ease. You know, when someone is spiritually dead, they're dead. And the wrath of God intends to help them along with that. And if they want to believe a lie, he's going to help them out with it. If they won't study his word. As I stated before, that's written, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. So this is one of the plagues of God's wrath that is different, that pulls in the witnesses and the church as witnesses. Now understand what I said. Don't, don't say I said the church is the two witnesses. I didn't say that. I said God uses the two witnesses, kaya in the Greek, and uh, the church as witnesses. What? The Holy Spirit speaking through them. It's written, Matthew 24, Mark 13, Luke 21. So there's things to do. What an exciting time to live. Yes, this fourth vial stands out like a big thumb. Why? It's got your thumbprint on it. Okay, let's continue on. And back, let's return to, no, let's go a little further in this 11. Verse 7, and when they shall have finished their testimony, when the witness is over, the beast that ascendeth out of the bottomless pit shall make war against them. Who is that? Well, the false Messiah, of course. And shall overcome them and kill them, and their dead bodies shall lie in the street of the great city, which spiritually is called Sodom and Gomorrah. I mean, it's as bad spiritually as that, where also our Lord was crucified. Where is that? It's Jerusalem. Don't take your eyes off that city as far as prophecy is concerned it all hinges there and they of the people and kindreds of tongues and nations shall shall see their dead bodies three days and a half and shall not suffer their bodies to be put in grave we know that at that time it's time for our father to return the son to return he's going to and that's when the the seventh vial is poured out and boy are things going to be corrected you 
as one of God's servants, have nothing to worry about from the wrath of God. I want you to repeat that to yourself every day if you ever get to thinking that way. He's not angry at you. God doesn't get angry at people that love him. He's only angry at those that belligerently refuse to even believe upon him or think it's nonsense. Do you think God's going to bless someone that thinks he's nonsense? Whoa, look out. He's going to put them right under his thumb. He's got his thumb on their number. He'll make happy days for them, all right. And then they'll wonder, I wonder why my head is shot with pot. A little crack here. I've got a little crack in my brain, I think. You know, I wonder who did this to me. Wake up. You know, that's nonsense. You and no one else is responsible for your condition. You know, it's about, well, you don't know. They told me. No, no. You listen to them. Don't, don't, try to, don't try to pass the buck. Be responsible for yourself. That's what's wrong with this world today in large part is people will not be responsible for their actions. You better be responsible for it because God's got it written down. You're going to answer for it, like it, lump it, good, bad, or ugly, or somewhere in between. I, and I know with, in you all's case, it's sweet. And he loves you. Return to 16, Revelation. Okay, let's, let's take um, the fifth angel. Okay, and the fifth angel poured out his vial upon the seat of the beast. And his kingdom was full of darkness and they gnawed their teeth for pain. You know who's going to cause that one? That's the witnesses of the two candlesticks. When they begin to, where's Satan's seat? Well, he tells you where he's going to plant it, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, right on Mount Zion, claiming to be God when he builds God's temple. But when our witnesses are delivered up to be tried by him, it's going to pour a lot of heat on his seat, all right? You can take that any way you want to because that's what it's going to be. That means there is action there on the part of the two candlesticks. The two candlesticks are very important. You're not playing games. You're not playing church. It's a reality. Verse 11, And blasphemed the God of heaven because of their pain and their sores and repented not for their deeds. And the sixth angel poured out his vial upon the great river Euphrates. Now, of course, this is the one that the spurious Messiah de facto appears. And the water thereof was dried up that the way of the kings of the east might be prepared. The whole world is brought into it at that point. Now, remember biblically, don't, don't take your eyes and go all the way to the Euphrates River and expect it to be dried up. It's not going to be. But the Euphrates River has always been the border between Israel and Babylon. It means the rope is going to be dropped, and quite frankly, Jerusalem is going to become Babylon, Megiddo. The gather, Megiddo in the Hebrew tongue means the gathering place of the crowd. That's where they are, playing God. And you're going to be used to put a stop to that. Pour it right on the seat of Satan, sound like fun? Don't let it frighten you. God takes care of his own. Verse 13, and I saw three unclean spirits like frogs come out of the mouth of the dragon and out of the mouth of the beast and out of the mouth of the false prophet. Do you know what um, unclean spirits are? I, I wanna, you're going to take a home assignment. I'm not going to go there. I'm not going to take the time to teach you. You're all familiar with it. The first epistle of John Chapter 4, it tells you that any spirit is unclean if it hath not Christ. Okay? So that kind of separates the believer from the non-believer. The unclean spirits naturally go the opposite way of what you will be going. The false prophet, of course, is the false messiah. 14, for they are the spirits of devils 
working miracles. And I don't mean little miracles. I mean it's going to be big miracles in the sight of men. A lot of people are going to be fooled by my friends. Watch the signs of prophecy. Which go forth into the kings of the earth and of the whole world to gather them to the battle of that great day of God Almighty. That's the day we look forward to. Unclean spirits, lying prophets. Going to meet him this way. Going to meet him that way. You're going to meet him the way the word states. Period. Behold, I come as a thief. Blessed is he that watcheth and keepeth his garments. Lest he, be, he walk naked and they see his shame. The garment is made from fine linen woven together from your righteous acts. If you have enough righteous acts to make a, a nice flowing, uh, what you may call it, robe, fine. But if you've got just enough for a teeny weeny bikini, there you are, friend. If you don't have enough for that, guess what? Happy birthday. <laughs> Verse 16, and he gathered them together into a place called in the Hebrew tongue Armageddon. Arm means city, town, hill. Megiddo means the gathering place of the crowd. What crowd? Satan's crowd. Where are they? Paul told you, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, right in Jerusalem. That's why Jesus said there won't be a stone left standing atop another when I hit the earth at the seventh trump. And the seventh angel poured out his vial into the air, and there was a great voice out of the temple of heaven. Heaven this time, not earth. Make a note of it. From the throne saying, it is done. Now, that gives us kind of a, a, a large blueprint. What, what we really need to do, though, time-wise... Is, is blow this thing up on, you know, kind of the end of the thing so we get a little better idea of how it's going down and where what nation's going to be and, and where we are right now. So you don't have to turn anywhere but continue on into the next chapter, chapter 17. And I want you to be real sharp for me because everything we have taught this weekend consummates in these few verses I'm going to read in closing. But there is so much wisdom and knowledge for you in it, so be sharp. I know we're tired, but be alert, be awake. You're all familiar with chapter 17. I don't have to cover all of it about the, the great harlot. That means the harlot that went with the false god. Let's pick it up, if we may, with verse 7. Verse 7 reads, And the angel said unto me, Wherefore didst thou marvel? And, beloved, you should marvel on this day. You should know what's going on, all right? I will tell thee the mystery of the woman. Hot ziggity, this is what we want to know. And of the beast that carried her, which hath the seven heads and ten horns. Verse 8. The beast... That thou sawest was, now listen to this, important, was, is not, and shall ascend out of the bottomless pit. Well, now there's your clue. Who, there's only one comes out of the bottomless pit. It's, it's, it's Satan. All right? I mean, just set that in your notebook. It's there. Uh, and they that dwell on the earth shall wonder in amazement whose names were not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world when they beheld the beast that was and is not and yet is. In other words, whose name was written in the book of life before the foundations of the earth? God's elect. Ephesians chapter 1 verse 4, I chose you before the foundations of this earth. That's to say the first earth age, the overthrow, when Satan tried to trick people to get there, you were too sharp for it. And God knew he could count on you again. Even as he told Jeremiah the prophet in the first six verses of chapter 1, Jeremiah, he says, hey, I knew you before you were ever in your mother's womb, boy. And I chose you as a prophet while you were in the womb. Did Jeremiah have a choice? No, he was elected. Why? Because of what he earned. 
in that first earth age. Oh, how crippled you are if you're not familiar, if you've got blinders on about the first earth age. You would think God was unfair if you didn't understand it and what happened there. So here we know that we got something that was and now he is not, but he's going to be again. We know it's Satan. Well, let's, let's go on. Let's try to put it together. We're, I guarantee you we're going to. All right. You got it made, folks. We're going to put it together. All right. Verse 9. And here is the mind which hath wisdom. That's yours, beloved. So be sharp. The seven heads are seven mountains, are nations, are kingdoms, whichever way you want to translate it. Probably it will be easier for you to solve the riddle if you'll translate it kingdoms, plural, on which the woman sitteth. Verse 10, listen carefully. And there are seven kings, five are fallen, and one is, and the other is not yet come. And when he cometh, he must continue a short space. Okay, let's do some homework. If we figure out what it's talking about, we should be able to tell by which kingdom is there now. We're talking about Jerusalem. You know that, don't you? You better. Or I've wasted my whole weekend, except for communion. <laughs> I'm teasing. Watch Jerusalem. That's where it happens. Right? That's what it's talking about. Now, you see, you were given a great clue of wisdom through the book of, of, uh, of Daniel because it's an overlay of Revelation. And these beast nations, you had the head of gold, the brass, the iron, and the clay, and the ten toes of mingled iron and clay. But the important starting point, God made it so simple he said, Nebuchadnezzar, you are this golden head. That was the start, okay? So that's our starting point. What does it mean five are fallen and one is? If we can figure that out, we know where we are on this clock today. So let's just stop and do a little homework. Number one, it's a lead pipe cinch. You can count on it was Nebuchadnezzar. It was Babylon, okay? So write down Babylon number one. We've got to get five that are already gone. Well, Babylon sure is, uh, of historically speaking, all right? Number two, Medio Persia. It's real easy to figure this when you run Daniel and the book of Revelations together. Number three, Greece, come and gone, all over. That is to say, as far as Jerusalem is concerned, now you keep your mind sharp and focus on Jerusalem. Just because I'm naming other countries, don't let your mind run there. We're talking about who controlled Jerusalem, all right? And I'm not scolding. I'm just helping you focus, all right, so that you don't get sidetracked. Watch Jerusalem. Who was number four after Greece? Rome. You're up to Christ time then. Rome controlled what? Rome? No, Jerusalem. And then who was number five? Beloved, from the year 636 A.D., all the way up to the year of our Lord, 1948. You can even write in 1967 if you want to on the Seven Day War for part of it. The Mohammedans occupied it. Mohammedan peoples. That was four. I'm, I'm sorry. That was five. Now who is six? Because it said right here, Five are fallen and one is. Who is this one? Well, it's the, it is the kingdom of the fig tree, both the good and the evil fig, conquered over the Mohammedans. Some of you might like to call them Palestinians. It's all right. That's where we are. 
that's pretty, that's, hey, we're set, that's wisdom, isn't it? It didn't say if you'll figure this out a little bit, it won't be hard for you. You'll understand it. And not only that, you'll know where you are now. Well, who's sitting there now? The generation of the fig tree, both the good and the bad fig. Jeremiah chapter 24. But what happens after that? That gets us up to six. Okay, well, let's read on. The one is, is six, and the other is not yet come. And when he cometh, he must continue a short space. Now, a little wisdom. Who, who was that again that came out of that pit? That's not a big mystery, is it? It's the Antichrist. He's seven. And he's only going to have a little short space. See, that's, that is lead pipe. There's no getting around it. I mean, that, that is solved, all right? We know where we are. And that's very important. But there's, there's still, we got another step in this thing here, and we got to figure it out, all right? We can't just leave ourselves hanging here this way. Well, let's go all the way to the end and see what happens here, all right? Verse 11. And the beast that was and is not, aha, here he is. Even he is the eighth. Oh, my word. We got another spot here. And is of the seven and goeth into perdition. My, that does sound complicated unless you think for a moment. And I've laid enough foundation this weekend. You're not going to have any trouble with it. What happened? Why did it say he is and then he's not because he's in the pit? And then he comes back out again. And then he goes into perdition. What's perdition? To perish. Well, what does he do? You know, when Isaiah chapter 14, during the millennium, they walk over and say, Ooh, he looked down that hole. There's the Antichrist. He's down. Is this the man that deceived the whole world? Look at him. Now, that's number seven, all right? He, I mean, he's in there, he's locked up, got the key to it, but what are we going to do? When we get through teaching a little discipline by taking names and kicking um, nonsense, <laughs> kicking nonsense, we're going to take that key and open that little old pit and let that sucker go again for the eighth time, all right? It's, it's pop-up test time to see if we have been good teachers or not. <laughs> because when he's released that time, God doesn't want any untested goods. Do you blame him? Look what happened the last time when it wasn't untested. I'm talking about the first earth age. Hey, Satan got along pretty good at first. He elevated right up to the protecting cherub. He protected the mercy seat until he wanted to sit on it. You know, so I think I'll just take that. I think it fits me. You know, well, so there you have him, and there you have the time, which means what? Here is wisdom. You're in the sixth right now, beloved, and, and I read it to be a pretty short period of time that you know exactly where you are. But probably one of the more important things is what are you going to do about it? Because the two candlesticks are very much in this. He doesn't give wisdom just to play with, all right? And is it not strange that when God releases wisdom, it's so simple that a child can understand it? It wasn't hard at all. That in itself is the miracle of our Father releasing knowledge when he's ready. And he releases it from where? His word. It was there all the time. As it is written in Mark 13, Jesus said, hey, I have foretold you all things. It's just a little difficult sometimes for us to figure them out. But you see, the church will witness. The church will witness against the Antichrist. And when the Holy Spirit speaks as it is written, it's going to upset him. But he can't do a thing about it because he's playing Jesus. So he's got to act like Jesus to play Jesus. He's got to say, you think about it a while and I'll pray for you. you know? And uh, you'll, you'll we're not to premeditate. And I always feel a little nervous when I start saying what you might say at that time. So I'm not going to do it. 
I'm not going to do it. We're just not supposed to premeditate. But, beloved, the thing and the whole point I'm trying to make is the two churches have a large part in this. God counts on them. He uses them. And he blesses them. And as we discovered yesterday, really the two churches are really only one. It's the church that Christ heads wherever those two segments go. Okay, so I think we pretty well nailed that. Now, if any of you had a problem with that and you're not studied well enough to follow that along, then order the little old tape, and I'm not trying to peddle tapes later about Passover, and run the side trips that I mentioned there that document what was said, and you'll have clear understanding. Let's go on. I'll read verse 11 again and re-explain, okay? I'll read 10 and we'll go on from there. 10. There are seven kings, five are fallen. The five that are fallen are Babylon, Medio Persia, Greece, Rome, and the Mohammedan. And one is, that's the sixth, which is to say the, the nation that is there now that we call biblically the fig tree, both good and bad, Jeremiah 24. And the other is not yet come meaning at the time this is given for you to fix yourself, the false Christ has not appeared yet, okay? So that you get fixed on what's happening here in 17. And when he cometh, he must continue a short space. And the beast that was and is not, that's the one back of verse 8, even he is the eighth and is of the seven. Why? He is the seven. It's just that he's going to do a little jail time in between. And goeth into perdition, which that Greek word apollyon means he's going to be destroyed, the destroyer even. Verse 12, and the ten horns which thou sawest are ten kings which have received no kingdom as yet, but received power as kings one hour with the beast. This is the hour of temptation, beloved, when the false Messiah is on earth. He will set up. A ten um, nation, one world rule. We all know about that, okay? It, but it won't happen until he gets here. Verse 13. These have one mind and shall give their power and strength unto the beast. Why? He's supernatural. He's controlled. These shall make war with the lamb. And guess what's going to happen? Who's with the lamb? Uh, well, we are. Well, let's read that again. These shall make war with the lamb, and the lamb shall overcome them. Oh, that's better, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. The lamb shall overcome them, for he is Lord of lords and king of kings, and they that are with him are called, chosen, and faithful, and two witnesses, and two candlesticks, and those he brings with him. What a time that's going to be. And you have a part in it. And you see where you are on the pages of time in God's word. And that's exciting, dear one. Verse 15. And he said unto me, The waters which thou sawest where the whore sitteth are peoples. It wasn't water at all, see. But God, you know, just because he uses symbolism, he still explains it. The waters which thou sawest where the whore sitteth are peoples and multitudes and nations and tongues. In other words, confusion builds upon confusion. Ignorance builds upon ignorance. Babylon, the, what is the prime of Babylon? Babel. What's Babel? Confusion. Lies. Not truth. No big deal. 16. And the ten horns which thou sawest upon the beast, these shall hate the whore and shall make her desolate and naked, and shall eat her flesh, and burn her with fire, or caused her to be burned with fire. They don't really care. Satan never has cared about anybody other than himself. And you know something? Somebody that really follows him, you watch them, that's all they care about is self. And they're going to take care of number one, and they don't really care about, they'll use people. So be, be real careful in this generation. If you got a friend, a friend indeed. I mean, love them, but be careful. 
For God hath put in their hearts to fulfill his will. What does that mean? God's in charge even of those that would go against us. And to agree and give their kingdom unto the beast until the words of God shall be fulfilled. And the woman which thou sawest is that great city which reigneth over the kings of the earth. Summation. The fourth vial. The two churches go into action. The two witnesses go into action. That's another benchmark. We move forward and he better explains for us. We focus in on history where it's easily to document. Can you imagine that Jerusalem was controlled for, how how much is 630, say, from um, 1948? Give or take, what did it be, 1,300 years? 1948, I think so. 1,300 years without changing hands, and all of a sudden, bam. Bam. Right here in your generation. That's where you are, friend. That's why it's so important that you be pleasing to our Father. Because He expects things from you. What things is that? Exactly what's written. That is, that you be a prepared, you know, most often it's called witnesses to allow the Holy Spirit to utilize you and never be afraid. Why? We've got the victory. We serve the King of kings and the Lord of lords. If somebody touches you uh, when you're in his service, I want to repeat this, when you're serving him, When you're in him, when you believe, if someone touches you, it's like they stick their finger in God's eye. You think he doesn't, that doesn't get his attention? Of course it does. He swats them. I I believe that and have witnessed it. So God takes care of his own. What, What am I saying? You don't have anything to fear. Man only fears what he's ignorant about. What he doesn't know, maybe is a nicer way of saying it. But the truth is, what he's ignorant about, he's a little skeptic of it until he understands it. So be familiar with your father's word and understand it. And you can realize we don't have anything at all to fear. Our father's in charge. So you're in the sixth today in that 17th chapter. I make it to be a pretty short period of time. For as it is written in the great book of uh, Mark in chapter 13, after that fig tree generation, the sixth is set out, that will be the final generation. Another witness, but most of all, what I have tried to do is to draw us into it where you can focus better on where you're supposed to be watching and what you're probably most likely going to do I find it exciting, I find it thrilling, and um, I've always thought it was thrilling serving the Lord, you know, he's so good to us, and he's so gentle, he nudges us, he touches us, and when he says here is wisdom, it would be just like it was in the 13th chapter, the 18th verse, when he said, here is wisdom, here's the number of a man. And he's, he's the fake. He, he, he really lays it out real smooth for us. And as he has said today concerning those eight, here is wisdom. It's the same man, got it? Same man. And he's the same number six still in the vials to appear. So I hope that this gives you enough information to do home studies on, on your own. And I will give you a caution again. Never let some man draw your eyes away from Jerusalem as far as prophecies concerning the end time. Because it all points there and hinges on events that transpire there. And um, so, have fun with it. Enjoy. And um, it lets us know that the hour is late and that's good. And that's very good. Is it going to happen tomorrow? Nope. Nope. Is Dennis in the house? 
Yes. I'm, on, I'm just about to wrap this up, Dennis. Hey, it's been a wonderful weekend. I hope you've enjoyed it. Free introductory package. Say, this is something we would like to offer for a one-time gift to all the new folk that study with us. This introductory package gives you a monthly newsletter, which means each month you will receive a newsletter with a Bible study on it. Hey, raising funds? No way. We're not beggars. We're Bible teachers. That's what it consists of. A tape catalog that will give you all the topics that are covered. And the Mark of the Beast tape. What is this Mark of the Beast? Is it really on your forehead? No, Satan's considerably more intelligent than that. It's in your forehead, which is to say in your mind. Have you been deceived? This is a free offer to you, one time to each new student. Say, find out what's really happening and what the story is on the mark of the beast. Okay, let's get into some questions here. And uh, first we're going to take Sam from Florida. I think I heard you say that the spiritual bodies in the first earth and heaven age were different than these of the second earth and heaven age. If this is what you said, please give scripture to document this. It's, it's easy. In the first place, how, when, when God said at the beginning, about 6,000 years ago, if, if we were to count it by our today's calendar or if you counted the first week on God's calendar, it, we would be in about the 12th or 13th, 14,000th year now from the day that he first began the recovery from the overthrow, katabo in the Greek, the overthrow of Satan. And in, as you read, he said, let us make man in our, plural, our image. So, my documentation in part is that flesh man wasn't made until this earth age. That's why you will not find the remains. Whatever science may say, you will not find the remains of a flesh man past that time period. Sorry. Um, and it may, it may take the full 14. You're not going to go past that. Why? They didn't exist they had a different body. Were they here? Yes. Uh, your documentation for the fact that men walked the earth, I could show you a footprint. You've already seen it before in a rock that's over 50,000 years old. It wasn't a flesh man. But in as much as we were made in their image, it looked, that means a carbon copy. Our means God and the angels. And that's why you must be born from above, not born again. Okay. Born from above. You see, that's where the fallen angels went wrong. They refused to be. But anyway, your true, full, complete, and final documentation is Genesis chapter 6, verse 3. For it grieved God after that time of seeing the fallen angels seducing the daughters of Adam. It grieved him that he had created man in the flesh also because he created woman to bring forth that womb that each of us could pass through this earth age. Uh, born of woman, innocent of what happened before. Joseph from, um, from Maine, I believe that is. Pastor Murray, in the book of Acts, what does it mean when the sheet of food, is this all clean that we can eat? Please explain. No. No. What was the subject? <clears throat> let, let me finish reading here and maybe, maybe we'll... In Matthew, where it states everything we eat goes into our stomach and out the draft, what hurts you is what comes out. of that, That's your mouth, okay? <clears throat> Excuse me. Now, let's go, let's go back to Acts chapter 10, I believe it is, is what you have reference to. What was happening down at the gate in front of his house? I'm talking about Peter. What, well, here come three of Cornelius' servants. And they were coming up to that gate. <clears throat> you see, excuse me, up until that point, 
Peter wouldn't, he wouldn't give a Gentile the time of day. And, and God is working with him here. And that's what this whole thing is about. All right. And I'll document it to you here in a moment. And down come this sheet with hogs and creepy crawling things and what have you on it. And God told Peter to dig in there and eat. And Peter said, no, I'm not going to do it, God. He refused. Refused God. He said, I've never eaten unclean food in my life. Well, the stuff you've said don't eat, I don't. And whoosh, back up went the sheet. He didn't have to. Down it came again. Peter eat. No, Lord, I won't do it. And all God was showing him when you continue reading the chapter is he was so ticky about what he ate, but he was, so, he was more particular with who he shook hands with. That's kind of ridiculous, isn't it? And then God told him, I'm not talking about food. I'm talking about people, Peter. You will never after this day call any man common. That means unclean. In other words, don't you ever call a Gentile unclean again, Peter. And Peter got the whole message. Hey, it had nothing to do with feet, food, alos in the Greek, people, other people. You will not call them unclean. Because you see, the Israelites were kind of ticky about who they let in the temple and all this kind of stuff. God kind of gave them a little education in, in uh getting along with people and the fact that Christ died for everyone, all right? Doesn't have anything to do with food, okay? You know, uh, let, me, let me just hasten to add, God created certain foods for us to eat if you want to be healthy. Now, it's not a sin to the grave or anything like that. If you, if you want to eat bad stuff and get sick, that's up to you. But God told you, he created these flesh bodies and he knows what it takes to make them run pretty good, all right, without having to run to the doctor every day. And uh, so and Leviticus 11 is one of them. But if you want to take of that stuff and get sick, why? You can just about break it down. God created scavengers to keep disease away from us. In other words... You can take something that has died of itself and let an old possum come by and whop. It'll clean that up for you where a disease can't mount there. And then you got some people who say, Woo, grab that possum. <laughs> well, don't. All right, he's a scavenger. Don't eat possum. And, and you'll be healthy. It's just up to you, okay? So anyway, I, boy, we got our money's worth out of that, didn't we? We got people and food, so be that as it may. I probably shouldn't have done that because... Acts 10 had nothing to do with food. It wanted to make very clear, God wanted to make sure you don't call people uncommon. Uh, right? They're all his children, and he loves them. Lois from California. What does Lois want? I'm, 50, I was, I, I'm 58 years old. I was brought up in a church as a child, and I went to church every Sunday from... Sunday school to 11 o'clock service and the young people's service. Um, I have not been taught the Bible until you taught it to me. I was so hungry for a teacher f of my father's word. I prayed and prayed and on the first night and the first oh one, I turned on the TV and there you were. I can't get enough. Well, God's word is so good. I, I don't, I'm trying to get to your question, dear. I don't usually read compliments about myself, and, but it's not really a compliment about this teacher. It's a compliment about God's Word. You know, you can go to church uh, for 80 years, and if they don't teach God's Word there, you don't get taught, okay? It's that simple, and I won't, I'm not going to knock any church. And may God bless you, and he sure does. Thank you. Ah, here we go. And can you tell me what chapter can I find it? If you don't work, you don't eat. All right. We, we got to, you'll find that in, um, in 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 10. It says, if a man don't work, don't feed him. Okay. Now, a lot of people get nervous about that because they'll have some big old hairy-legged boy that's been with them. He's 30 years old and afraid to go out on his own. He's not really afraid to go out on his own. He just don't want to work. 
All right? So, God said, don't feed him. Why? Do you know what happened? Well, he'll starve. No, he won't. There's a God built in between the navel and the backbone. He put a little micro switch. And when that old navel gets pretty close to the backbone, that old boy gets hungry enough, he's going to say, man, I need to work. <laughs> and it'll change his complexion. It will give him an attitude adjustment. And he will become a wonderful family member that you can be proud of. That's, that's God's way of doing it. 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 10. Linda from California, and, and, and dear, I'm so glad that you're enjoying the word. Linda from California, do you think our deceased relatives could be angels? Well, they're in, what is the word? First, now I see I've got to say, what does the word angel mean? It means messenger, okay? Now, if God decides, to, they, they all, when you step out of this flesh body, and they do when it dies instantly, as it is written in, in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7, to be, uh, 7 and 8, to be absent from this flesh body, this meat, is to be present with the Lord. You're going home just that quick. So you're in a spiritual body. Does that make you an angel? Well, you are as the angels, for a messenger is one sin of God. They're in a spiritual body too. So your answer, kind of with that qualification. Johnny from Mississippi. Uh, how, how, you know, how you know the Bible and can explain it so well and remember the verses, can you tell me if it's, in the Bible where sin stinks in the nostrils of God. I thought I read it, but I can't find it. Well, it's kind of in this book of Isaiah, all right? It's one of the better places. Isaiah chapter 65, along about, and we'll make it verse 5, where God lists a bunch of sins, and he says, that's just like smoke in my nose, okay? Have you ever had smoke in your nose? It irritates, it grinds. It's smart. And when God's children sin with the sins that are mentioned in 65 of this great book of Isaiah, it's in his nostrils. Sonia from another place I can think of, the, the stench is in Ezekiel chapter 37, but it isn't God's nostrils. It's the nostrils of those that pass on the east. Sonia from Arkansas. Is it written that when a person dies, it is his or her time to go? No, it isn't, you know. We could say, like we, we had a lecture here not too many times ago when Hezekiah was told, God told him, said, hey, you're a dead man. You are on your way out, boy. And Hezekiah got busy and he fell down on his knees and he prayed and he prayed and he prayed and God gave him 15 more years. Well, his time was kind of set. But no, nobody knows the instance and many times we bring... We bring death on by carelessness, accident, or accidents just happen, all right? That's why a person wants to know that you're always in pretty good standing with our Father. Then you don't even have to worry about it, all right? 